we are in Silicon Valley right now. Uh, the tech bubble shows no signs of bursting, mm -hmm. and game developers like EA are competing directly with yep. the Googles and the Apples of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the biggest challenge, first and foremost, is going to be the working conditions issue. I mean, this industry, as part of its maturity as an industry, and, and that's one of the things I think the industry needs to own up to, is one of my frustrations is oftentimes this industry, as powerful as it is as an economic force and a cultural force these days, I don't think we always live up to that. You know, I mean, and you can evidence that by some of the ways that, like, even you know, you go to a city, they have a film office to try and attract films to come and, you know, set up and do a production in their, in their city, and, um, but they don't do much for game development. I mean, that's, that's changing, more and more it's changing. But, um, I, so we as an industry, I think we need to address the working conditions issues head on um, in much the same way over the past year because of certain incidents that have happened online. We're dealing with the diversity issue very much head on now as it, um, in a very you know, clear, top-down, constructive way. And I think the working conditions one is one that we have to face as an industry and say, you know what, if we want to mature, if we want to retain talent, because those other non-game companies are going to keep sprouting up. And then you've even got competition from things like SpaceX and some of the other um, technical industries out there. I mean, SpaceX shows up with a booth at GDC. Why? Because they're trying to recruit game developers for their projects. So there's a lot of competition, so I think we need to really address some of these issues if we want to keep our talent. All right, Kate Edwards, thank you, and keep raising your sword to defend the industry. I will. I will. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you to Kate and Kat. Uh, talking about creative leadership to make meaning and money, I'd like to welcome to the stage Megan Geyser, founder and CEO of Contagious Creativity, and she'll be interviewed by Daniel Bernstein, VP at Core, and please give them a warm welcome. Slide. Yep. There How about that? How about that? The guys, thanks so much for uh, for sticking to the end. Uh, we've obviously saved the, the the best for last here, right, Megan? Oh yeah. <laughs> so I wish I dressed up. <laughs> How do you follow that act? Very very hard. Very hard to do that. But uh, so now that we actually have the uh, slide about what is creativity, what you know, let's let's kind of ask each other what, what we think creativity is from 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 our pers sure. perspective. So that's a formal definition, but um, a simpler way of putting it is uh, creativity is a skill within us. It's um, a way of being that uses all of our senses to uh, sidestep what's not working to do or make something better. It's our innate way of knowing, innate ability to know. And uh, I love John Cleese's definition but I would take it one step further and say creativity is our human operating system because it accesses all domains of knowing for good sake. Yeah. What, do you, what would you say? Well, I would say, you know, for me, it's, that's, that's, that's perfect. Human operating system. Essentially, uh, um, creativity is imagination that's untethered from any of our uh, assumptions that we have right. about uh, life or, or work or anything that we do. So it's... I think it's an opportunity to be completely, totally, um, uh, you know, certainly in the clouds. And, uh, you know, that, that is the ultimate goal of creativity is to tapping into that potential to build something that, is, that has substantial meaning. Mm -hmm. That's what we're, we're going to talk about today. So let's, let's start with your story, Megan. I mean, you've, uh, you know, we've, we've known each other uh, for a while, so I, I certainly know your story, but why don't you share it with the rest of the group here? Okay. Uh, so my background is film. I was a documentary and educational filmmaker. Uh, and in 97, I got hired at Herner Interactive as creative director. Um, and two years later, uh, with no warning, I became CEO. And it happened in a board meeting. The original CEO resigned, and they looked at me and said, we think you can do it. And that's how I got the job. Um, I had no formal uh, management, technical, or um, financial training. I was raised creatively, so I led that way. And we went from 
from zero to 8.5 million in revenues. We sold nine million games, uh, created a new market niche, and uh, for a decade, we enjoyed inspired employees and customers, consecutively award-winning games, um, yearly revenue growth, and for a long time, very little competition. And um, it wasn't until I left Her Interactive uh, two years ago, after 15 years, that I understood how we did it, how we defied the odds in an unwelcoming environment, first of all, and with a totally unconventional CEO. And I realized it was because we went against the grain. We sidestepped the system uh, and um, basically uh, redesigned it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was because we bucked the system. We, um, we took risks, which I think was really important, to do what was necessary for a higher purpose. And we knew it was the right thing to do, and we were determined to make it happen. So let's talk about some of the risks that you took uh, that, that, let, that made you lead creatively. Um, or maybe as a result of leading creatively, yeah. those, those risks. So one of them was uh, when, I, when I began, I was instructed uh, that I was to serve at the pleasure of the board, and I decided to also serve at the pleasure of the customers and the audience, uh, because that actually worked out really well. And um, the other was that you know, the system didn't include us, so we re redesigned it. Uh, we weren't welcome in retail, so what we did is find somebody to teach us how to publish on Amazon, and we, got, we backdoored it into retail. So as soon as our sales started taking off, the um, publishers came back and we got a deal in retail. Then when we got into retail, uh, we realized the publishers were making the lion's share of the profit, so we did the same thing. We got someone to teach us how to publish in retail, and that's when, our, uh, that's when it took off for us. No, that's great. That's great. So, so let's let's talk about kind of the ways that you led your team creatively. What are the th some of the things that happened along the way that uh, that kind of challenged and maybe encouraged you? Right. Well, I had a background in film, and it was creative collaboration. So I was uh, more of a co-creator and a collaborator than a decider and an overseer. Um, I hired business people who respected the creative process, uh, and I led with the values of creativity, which are uh, open-mindedness, uh, curiosity, that first and foremost, uh, kindness, uh, respect for diverse uh, people and perspectives, uh, risk-taking in the face of uncertainty. And uh, I told people what I knew and I didn't know, and no one really needed to know everything uh, because actually that would have uh, ruined the positive flow. And, and it was so palpable uh, that girls who came for tours, which we did very often, they would very often leave and say, I want to work at Her Interactive. No, yeah, that's very interesting. So, so you know, as, as we're, you know, we're at a business con uh, conference, so that translates into, into money. Now, you know, how did that uh, apply to Nancy Drew Games? What are the, some of the assumptions that were broken as a, as a result of this type of thinking, and, and how did that kind of drive the, you know, drive the opportunity with Nancy Drew? For making meaning? Yeah. Think, yeah. yeah. Um, so we didn't want to make just a fun game. We wanted to make a game that inspired girls to lead, which is consistent with, you know, Nancy Drew, who inspired generations of women. And uh, so we fused entertainment and education in such a fun way they didn't even know they were learning. And we integrated cultural and historical references uh, to uh, expand their imaginations of what was possible and also what had been done. And, um, you know, we also uh, would have girls come for tours regularly and then you know, we get like six or seven people to drop what they were doing and have conversations with the girls and to, you know, if she can see it, she can be it. And really, they left a foot taller. I mean, they came in kind of, you know, not really very confident and they left realizing this is something I could do. And the other great thing was we, over the decade, we got thousands and thousands of testimonials from the girls saying, 
They were so inspired by the games that they went on to become scientists, cryptologists, detectives. We had a NASA engineer who volunteered to be a moderator. Uh, and it was on and on and on. And that fueled our pride. And we, it made us want to do it over and over again. No, so, no, that's interesting. And we'll talk about meaning. That is the highest meaning of all, when yeah. you can inspire somebody and have a life-changing right. uh, right. life thing for them. But we, we do, you know, one of the things that happens is that, you know, as, as game developers, we do make a certain set of assumptions about our audiences. And, oh, yeah. You know, right. we, certainly do, we certainly did that um, you, back in the dawn did, of did, casual did games. Did you do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, when we thought, okay, well, you know, casual games are all about games like Bejeweled. Uh, right. But uh, but I think it takes uh, it takes a certain amount of bravery to buck that trend. We did that with games like Tradewinds and Westward, and I know you know these assumptions that you you've encountered. You know uh, you know I think you you've been talking about how uh, specifically with Nancy Drew. So it'll be curious if you kind of uh, uh, hit those same uh, same set of uh, uh, set of assumptions. Yeah, we yeah. did the same thing. I mean, we assumed that. You know, the target audience was girls 9 through 13, which, you know, growing up, that, that was who usually read the books. And that was true, except actually when we got the, the Nancy Drew license, it was dead. Uh, so we had to actually revitalize it. And what happened is, uh, what surprised us is the mothers bought the games for their daughters to inspire them as they were inspired as kids. And then the moms got hooked on the games. And then they gave the, mo the games to their moms, and so it became a cross-generational ph phenomenon. Uh, and you know, we had an audience we didn't even expect. So you know, it really um, made us realize that w you know the games were challenging enough for a wide range and entertaining. So yeah, we we that was a big surprise for us. Yeah, no, I, I think assumptive thinking. Leads to ah, that's exactly yeah, right. Leads to that kind of the feeling of uh, okay, well, it's it's the same old, same old. Look, folks, we see that in our industry as well. And wouldn't, wouldn't you agree, Megan? Now that you know we've got mobile games that address uh, a target market in which you know large public uh, uh, game companies address that really well, or historically have addressed it really well. What they're trying to do is essentially one plus uh, that experience and not really think too far outside of the box. To generate some of the, the the new types of types of content, whereas really kind of unleashing that larger creative process could lead them into into possibly creating uh, experiences that are that are far more um, that can generate far more profitable products for them in the in, in the future. Totally. So, Here's one one example of yep. that. When we um, were making games for girls, uh, we were advised if you're going to make games for girls, make them pink, and they'll all come. Uh, we made them unpink and they all came. Uh, the idea, the stereotypes are limiting revenue opportunities. And, you know, it's also giving a dulling effect of, of what it is to be human. And, and just we're missing out on new market niches and genres. I mean, you know, it's so imperative that we start expanding our perspectives and views of uh, all of us. There is many perspectives as there are people and we're only tapping a few yeah and what's interesting is you know more more so than any other time in the history of uh, business or industry we've got a diverse workforce and for the most part uh, you know you look at the product coming out of that uh, diverse workforce and it is pretty plain vanilla right so there's there's that kind of dulling down of right. that and and you know, the, 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 hes the hesitation to make risks, to continue that kind of arbitrage equation of cost of acquisition versus lifetime value leads to very uninspired decision making. Correct. And, uh, you know, which, is, which is interesting. So, you know, kind of what is the difference in what you've seen in the industry between how we lead today and, and what really an inspired leadership would be all about? Well, uh, creative leadership encourages what's possible. Uh, and uh, creative leadership uh, requires that we lead with creative intelligence, which is sensing, intuiting, imagination, uh, um, feeling, uh, perceiving, and supported by analytical intelligence, which is logical, linear, linear and literal thinking. And traditional leadership leads with analytical intelligence, uh, which may or may not be supported by creative intelligence. And creativity has been 
you know, dismissed and, and really underestimated, uh, it's usually relegated to making art or products. Uh, and I, I, it's because it hasn't been, uh, you know, the value hasn't been quantified, but that's no longer the case. The science of creativity has been proven. Yeah, there's lots of studies and, and, and academic journals that really focus on, right. on that. Yeah. Um, but and, also, and you know, whether you call it conscious leadership or facilitative or right. creative, the, the basic tenets are the same. But also it's reflected in industry, you know, the, the inspired companies. One that comes to mind is, is PopCap pre, you know, pre-EA acquisition. It's, uh, it's a company that, had, that was very, very inspired. They created products that were completely outside of the box. Right. You know, they, trying to find similarity between Plants vs. Zombies and Bejeweled right. uh, is, is, is very difficult. It's, it's, it's a fully uh, out-of-the-box thinking type of environment. And, uh, and the market uh, really, as they redo, you know, redefine themselves multiple times in their history, the market really, uh, 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 I guess, accepted and, and rewarded them uh, for their ability to, to innovate creatively. And you know, Google is another example, right? Yeah. So they've got a, uh, you know, they, they for, for a long time, and maybe even still, they've got, you know, you work on your own personal project for a day, uh, and, and completely, uh, untethered to whatever else is happening in, in corporate priority. So what does that lead to, right? What that leads to uh, really tapping is into those diverse voices to create that really fantastic experience that couldn't have been done if it was uh, uh, being driven from top down. That's right. Yeah. Um, so what happens if we don't lead this way? What we don't change the way that we, we lead. What happens if we just keep that kind of hierarchical structure associated with leadership? Well, first, it's uh, financial. We're, we're missing out on revenue opportunities, uh, new market niches, new audiences. Uh, it's, um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and next is the breadth of you know, original stories and, and wide-ranging characters that we're still missing is really leaving a dulling effect on us. It, is, uh, it leaves us with... Um, a simplistic and a homogenistic view of what it is to be human. Uh, creativity is the most important skill set in the 21st century and the most valuable uh, leadership advantage we can employ. And uh, I was thinking the other day, you know, we upgrade our computers when they're not ma functioning at their maximum capacity. Why wouldn't we do the same with ourselves? Yeah. No, exactly. It, you know, when you look at the industry overall, you've got you know games such as Monument Valley that are relegated to toward that indie category, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they don't see the light of day uh, from perspective of well, let's let's actually figure out exactly what's going on and why uh, a game such as this has such incredible broad market appeal. Uh, and so what happens is I think a lot of the the indie games are being denigrated. Uh, and being just labeled, okay, they're just they're just indies, they're one-offs, they're never gonna, you know, that that's not a model that's sustainable, that's never gonna work. We're gonna focus on the things that we've done before, and that leads to that kind of dulling, uh, chasing that uh, what we call in the investment business that red ocean effect that you have right now in the games industry. That's right, and I think you know the past few years have been such a wake-up call for all of us. Um, you know, leadership determines uh, the quality of our leadership determines the quality of our workplaces our cultures and the media products we interact with uh, and uh, you know I think it's time to do things differently um, leadership is behavior and people need to be inspired not managed because inspiration uh, is what brings us meaning through our deepest values and you know that gives us the meaningful purpose to innovate for good sake. Um, now, in, in the diversity, uh, diversity panel, you actually talked about, the, uh, talked about unconscious bias at UCB and, and the effect of unconscious bias on, on dulling, that, that dulling that, respect, that ability for us to, 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 to create, um, uh, create these inspired products and right. think, think outside of the box. Right. So how does that unconscious bias and the, and the inherent assumptive thinking associated with, with, uh, uh, with that, how does that really hold us back from, from having not only diversity in leadership, but also in diversity in thinking and, and uh, inspiration and product? Um, 
It's a big question. <laughs> yeah, okay. Before I say that, I just wanted to say one thing. I, I really predict that those companies who do not invest in creative leadership in the next five years will lose market share to those who do. Yeah. And it's linked to unconscious bias because leading with the values of creativity uh, diminishes the unconscious bias. It dissolves the fear and it makes us more self-aware, which is the first step in actually embodying our full human potential and leading with our best selves. And then once we're inspired, we inspire others because behavior is contagious. So getting to unconscious bias, unconscious bias is a, is a, is a blind spot. It's a bad habit we all have. And it prevents us from uh, letting go of our perceived notions to uh, expand our imaginations, to welcome diverse people and perspectives. And, uh, and because it's unconscious, we often don't realize we have it. And what's worse, uh, we think we're right. And, uh, and so it requires uh, raising our awareness to positively shift our behavior. Um, mindfulness techniques are a first step uh, to make that perceptual and experiential shift. And, um, you know, when we are fully present, uh, we connect with rather than uh, have bias towards others. Uh, in other words, we inspire ourselves so we can inspire others. So there, you know, right now there are great starts at eradicating unconscious bias, but I don't think they are it. I think some of them are band-aids, like quotas, you know, or, band, or um, taking an unconscious bias course. Now, that's, um, a, they're great steps, but that's more informational. It has to be, you know, on a daily basis, and it has to be intentional that we're thinking about our thoughts so we can start to change them so our behavior is different. And then we can welcome diverse content, diverse leaders, diverse thinkers, and then all of us will be collaborating together. And I think our time is up. Yeah. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Left hand. Thank you. I got it. Great right. job. Great job. Excellent. Thank you to Megan and Daniel. Uh, so, for our last session of the day, uh, talking about VR games, how the next platform will deepen the relationship between Hollywood and gaming, it is my absolute pleasure to bring on the stage Peter Levin president of Interactive Ventures and Games at Lionsgate, and he'll be interviewed by Ian Scher, executive editor at CNET, who believes that this is saving the best till last. Please welcome them to the stage. Thank you, sir. All right. <clears throat> Woohoo! Best for last, definitely. OK, so um, Peter, first off, uh, you know, I think what's really interesting to me is that the movie industry has this kind of weird sinusoidal pattern, right? Where they will invest heavily in games and then they'll stop investing in games, they'll invest again, they'll do license, they'll do their own, they'll do license again. So why don't you talk to me a little bit about just kind of where we are right now in that pattern and maybe tell me, can this actually be done well? Can the video game industry, uh, can a, a movie company make video games that are good? So I think resounding yes to, to, to that question. I think that was the easy one, right? <laughs> yeah, let's reverse engineer your query. Um, the, it's a unique moment in time. Um, I think the, the media companies um, in mass are um, looking at the games part of their business um, in a, a much different manner, you know, through a different lens. Um, you see you know, companies like Warner Brothers, for example, over the last seven, eight years, uh, take breathtaking strides um, in bringing phenomenal product to life, whether it's Arkham or uh, uh, Mortador. Um, what they've been able to do with the Lego properties, uh, coupled to their own intellectual property, um, it's, it's again, it's definitely a left of center um, direction you know, versus where big media was a decade ago. Um, I think the fundamental driver there is that the economics can no longer be ignored. So you're Meaning no that video games are such a large industry now, you have to do it. That's right. I mean, I think the interactive business at Warner Brothers drove something like $1.5 billion of revenue. Um, 
in, in the last year. So you know that's nothing to to sneeze at. I wouldn't mind having that. Much. I wouldn't mind having that either. Um, but the, the the other dynamics that are that are happening, you know, with the state of the games business, um, you've got um, the type of engagement you haven't seen before, um, and whether that's free to play, mobile, social, tablet, uh, whether that's DLC, um, whether that's and I don't even want to call them licensed properties, but I think partnering between intellectual property um, and uh, game mechanics um, that are creating sustainable, long-term product uh, that lives on multiple platforms in multiple environments, that just did not exist before. So the model that used to exist was, you know, very short shelf life, mm -hmm. right? You know, six to eight weeks, shrink wrap, trucked, you know, through a, a holiday cycle, and then you're in, you're out, and if if you're moving units, you can sustain life, and if not, on to the next one. And now you've got titles that are living for years. Um, and they're not only uh, driving um, revenue, but they're creating a very unique conduit of engagement uh, with those audiences of those intellectual properties. Um, and that, that we have not seen before. So um, I think across the board, you're seeing a very healthy appetite and some different approaches from different media companies. Uh, to how they're treating this business, but they're now looking at it very much as a business, not just an extension of their licensing and merchandising exercise. Which is interesting. So how do you avoid the kind of boom and bust that tends to happen for a company that is working outside of its core competency? Because we see that, right, where a company will have some real success with something, and then they'll kind of maybe not have as much success, and okay, pull back, right? And it turns into this weird boom and bust cycle. Um, it, you know, I wouldn't say that it's not in their core competency because mm -hmm. what it is, it's just a, it's telling stories in another medium. Okay. So I, I, that is their core competency, and they are we are a hits-driven industry at our core. We are a you know Lionsgate probably as much if not you know more more than most. You know, we are a content company full stop. Um, that's both exciting and at, you know at times um, it you know it, it can be daunting. Right. Um, because you're adapting intellectual property in different mediums. So, you know, what we're looking for um, in terms of the adaptation of our intellectual property in, in the realm of gaming um, is the same passion, uh, the same dedication, the same vision that we look for when we look for a showrunner in television, right? Um, with shows that we put on the air like Mad Men and Orange is the New Black, and the same way we look for writers, producers, directors of our theatrical product, you know, Hunger Games and Twilight and Divergent. Um, upcoming Power Rangers, so um, we're now considering it, you know, as contemplatively, albeit it's a nascent part of our business. Right. But I don't think there's any less discipline applied to finding those partners and how we deploy against it. Makes sense. So how does VR change the dynamic here? Uh, um, right now, most of the noise that's made in VR is around video games. Right. I hear. I'm sure there's some people in the audience who are like, no, there's still video in movies, but. Maybe you can talk to me a little bit about how you guys are looking at this and how you're thinking it through. Yes, I mean, several different ways. So um, like every new medium and environment, um, you know, marketing and promotion is driving a lot of the early traction. Right. And that's very okay, because how better to raise awareness for an emerging platform than to couple that experience to ginormous intellectual properties, right? You know, who wouldn't want a Hunger Games VR experience you know, the likes of which we just executed against our marketing team did in, in New York in partnership with Samsung, you know, to uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I think, well-deserved praise for that group. Um, so it creates that lift. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of a rising tide. Um, but the, you know, some of the, the very discreet games products that, you know, we're developing, um, we have a John Wick first-person shooter a game coming out uh, first, second quarter next year in partnership with Grab Games. Uh, and Starbreeze and Weaver. Um, but the interesting thing there, it, at its core, and, and you'll understand this when the hardware ships, it is both an experience and a game. And that game mechanic and understanding that game mechanic is very much predicated on the consumption of that experience. So I think you know, VR is giving us this wonderful hybrid opportunity, this, this palette to play with. Um, Ill-defined boundaries right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know some of the stuff that that we're seeing coming out of Valve. Uh, nothing short of brilliant. Um, you know you have to rip that headset you know off your head. 
Um, and sure, there's gaming mechanics to it and there's an underlying gaming narrative, but I would argue that the experience itself is both commercial. Um, I think those are gonna be episodic content that's derivative um, of both existing IPs and there'll be original intellectual properties that are adapted within the environment. So yeah, I think some of the, the early excitement is from the games audience. Perhaps much of that is due to the fact that you know, Valve and Steam with 125 million plus gamers there's a lot of context for gaming. You know, Morpheus and PlayStation 4, there's a lot of context for gaming. Of course. Um, you know, with those two platforms, you know you have the computation power to drive a qualitative VR experience. You know, perhaps less so with some of the other hardware, um, but we're figuring it all out. I think it's one of those unique moments in time where it's so much more about the stake and not the sizzle, right? So everyone who's played with it is just overwhelmed. Um, and some of it's got a ways to go. But I think everyone, you know, everyone I know that's put it on is, is wowed. Um, and so I think I give the hardware folks a lot of credit for not shipping prematurely. Let's wait till we get it right. You know, this is worth waiting for. Yeah. Um, Although the first hardware is launching in November. This is true. Yeah. But again, there's been, you know, some of these deadlines have been pushed. And, you know, interestingly, you don't get a lot of um, negative blowback because I think, you know, people are feeling like this is a real thing. Not, you know, again, not smoke and mirrors, not a marketing exercise. Right. Well, that's, the, that's what's interesting to me right now is that a lot of the, at least the way Hollywood is approaching VR, is around marketing, right? That it seems as though finding ways to take your IP and apply it to VR is still something that's very experimental at this stage. And so the best thing to do is just create experiences. You know, I, I, I would argue that I think, you know, again, Jaunt recently raised, you know, um, uh, some capital from, you know, established industry players like Disney. Sure. Um, and I can tell you, you know, my, my peers over there are not just looking at that as, oh, this is a great way for us to promote and market our intellectual property. There will be a degree of that. But sh demonstrate to me a successful medium where commercial product did not live alongside promotion and marketing. You go to a film, you're going to see trailers. You're going to see commercials when you get to the theater. You watch television, you're going to see commercials. You're going to see integrated marketing. So I think that's actually a sign of a, of a healthy platform emerging where there's gonna be the coexistence of marketing and promotion right alongside commercial product. And I can, you know, at our shop, we're doing, you know, a lot of both has been messaged to the marketplace. Uh, we're taking it very seriously on the commercial side, but working hand in hand with our, our marketing brethren um, because again, that is a very, um, you know, low cost, if you will, way to raise awareness because people are so trained on some of these massive IPs, you know, right. Divergent and Hunger Games, you know, they're showing up in droves for that experience. That's just a great way to draft behind um, if you're gonna go long on the, on the platform. Sounds good. So talk to me a little about, about eSports and what's going on there. I know you guys just got involved with um, one of the teams and maybe you can just talk to me a little bit about just kind of where you're seeing that all play out as well. Uh, seeing it play out, um, everywhere, right? So, you know, you've got everything from ESPN jumping into the deep end of the pool, uh, BBC recently announcing that, you know, they're going to stream Dota 2 championships, um, um, or they're going to air them rather than they're not going to stream them. They'll be on their, their proper... Airing and streaming, they're roughly. Well, they're, I beg to differ, but <laughs> yeah. uh, these days, cutting the cord. Um, there's the, um, th the ability to sell out these venues now domestically um, on par with, with how quickly these venues are selling out internationally. Yeah. It's taken a lot of folks by surprise. Um, the quality of brands and marketing partners um, that are jumping um, headlong into the esports arena. You know, there, if you think about it, there are very few sports um, that travel globally, right? So you've got soccer or football, um, you have martial arts, you know, mixed martial arts, and, and depending on you know, where you are geographically. Uh, they could be termed something else. And eSports is one of them. Um, you know, American football does not travel globally. Uh, baseball does not travel globally. Hockey does not travel globally. Um, it is one of those things where you feel that, you know, that upsurge, and again, I, I'm dating myself here, but as an early investor in game spy industries, um, way back in, in 99, 2000, we toyed around with some live streaming of some competitive gaming, and back then, bandwidth was not a commodity. Absolutely. So every time we put on one of these events, we lost a ton of money. But it was exciting to see the activity around it. And so you knew 
someone was going to build a better mousetrap, and clearly, you know, these folks um, are out there building better mousetraps. And there's a unique fraternal nature to esports right now. So, you know, yes, several of us did invest in a, in a franchise, but um, with a lot of support from the community. Mm -hmm. Again, it's one of those kind of rising tide. Um, let's get some folks in there that have backgrounds in sport, in media, in technology, working with marketing partners. Um, you know how to maximize those relationships. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing it come up conversationally uh, a lot. So when, when, when do I say the moment that esports has arrived? Like, does it take an Olympics to happen, like where it gets blessed by a major sporting venue? Or it, what does it take? It, it depends on your orientation. I would sure. say it's clearly, you know, has arrived. Um, I, you know, someone like myself who can operate a bit from both sides of my brain, you know, when ESPN jumped in, you know, that was, that was a major thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the numbers uh, were quite impressive. Um, but I, I feel that, you know, the, the, the amount of energy that is spent, um, you know, online, on, within social environments, um, within conferences such as this, you know, last year it was all VR. Mm -hmm. You could not escape the <laughs> VR subject line. Um, you know, this year it's very difficult to dodge, you know, the esports bullet, if you will. Uh, and that's, for those of us that have jumped into the deep end of the pool, that's a very exciting thing. Yeah, definitely. So, um, I guess we've got a little time if you want to ask questions from the audience, or is there anyone out there who's interested in anybody at all? Quiet you guys just all want to get up to the bar and get your post-conference cocktails going. You've got a Highwood man here. Game yeah. speed. Okay, so um, if no one, oh, we finally have one, okay. So I wanted to, Nicole Lazaro from Zio Design, Zio Play. Uh, <coughs> I'm really fascinated with the evolution of VR and uh, as a media. And how do you, how long do you think it's going to be uh, until like uh, VR experiences will be uh, truly like, feel very different than movies? Right now we still, a lot of the stuff is I'm, you know, kind of like you remember the early days of cinema where they put the camera in the best seat in the house and you kind of could look around, they just filmed stage plays. And then someone invented, okay, we've got frame for attention and we can cut to compress time. There'll be new stuff with VR, new kind of techniques, new language of VR. How long do you think and what might that look or feel like? Well, I can, I can tell you, um, you know, we have a large library of content at Lionsgate, 16,000 plus titles. Um, we have hundreds if not thousands of horror titles within that library, including Saw. So if you can think of a Saw-themed VR experience. I'd rather if, not. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, there's nothing that terrifies me more than that conceit. So, and I, we have seen some of the um, demonstrations of what horror-themed VR can be. Trust you me. It is absolutely nothing like sitting back and watching a scary movie. I couldn't rip that thing off my head fast enough. Um, but it's, it, so the, 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 you know, my answer to that is I think it's coming quickly. You know, I think some of it is going to have to be baked over time. I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of A-B testing. But the, you know, the best creators in the business, you know, the best writers, um, to your point about choreography, um, cinematographers, they're all jumping in to play with this. It's, they, no, no one sees this as gimmicky. Um, the conversation is not of a novelty. It's, this is just, to your point, just yet another medium within which we can do something very discreet. Um, but I promise you, if you're a fan of horror, I am not. Um, there's nothing scarier than some of the stuff that, that we have seen. Do, do you think that the way that, um, that like we're gonna get a two hour VR movie like, I'm going to watch Hunger Games 340 uh, in VR? Well, um, God willing, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I would say, that you know, that I'm bad. glad you brought that up because it, it is one of the, the, the ways that we will be um, commercializing uh, a VR environment, which is, you know, electronic cell through EST of our product. So you can think about themed theaters, mm -hmm. right? You're talking about, you know, an, an incredibly sophisticated quality viewing experience, you know, you get spoiled by, you know, these home audio video systems that not everyone could afford. Right. 
but you're able to buy one of these devices, you are replicating that experience. When I love the theater, I, I, I've played with the cinema's apps, and those are great, and I'm a big fan. But what I'm curious about is there's a difference between that and an actual, like, I'm in the world of the movie. So the question is, are we going to get to that point, or is that going to be something that's experiences only, and the movies are going to still remain, you know, I see it on a screen, granted, really awesome, big-ass screen on st in, in the world, but I'm not, like, in the movie. Yeah, I, again, I think you're going to have discrete examples of all of that. Okay. So I think you, there will be creators who say, no, no, I want you right there with us along for the ride. We've seen some of that. And then you're going to see you know, some monetization of an existing library. Um, and even a contemplation going forward that I don't want you that involved. It's still somewhat of a voyeuristic experience with just a much different aesthetic um, and a more, again, immersive consuming experience, which you know, lots of folks are very, very interested in. Cool. Um, anything else? I, I have no questions for any of you. One more? One more? Yeah. Um, so video games are traditionally a very, obviously, interactive medium. And uh, film is obviously very linear and uh, has, a, has a focus on storytelling. So I wonder, in your experience, are you seeing filmmakers interested in, to, in exploring that interactive nature uh, within VR? Within VR. Um, Can I shoot the bow myself? Yeah. No, I, I, <laughs> thank you for the master's degree and the obvious there. Um, <laughs> I, th I, I think the answer is yes, right? So we're Lionsgate, we're investors in Telltale Games, right? And, you know, Telltale, again, their own genre of gaming. Um, Lots of folks doubted them early on. Uh, they have clearly done something different and qualitatively and contemplatively. And we have, you know, once we made that investment, so many of the creators and writers that we worked with, you know, were running at us, you know, let's figure out a way to play together. Um, we're getting the same thing uh, with, with VR. Um, there's a lot of, you know, spending a lot of time with these types of folks. Similarly, you know, with game creators, um, there's a learning curve and they tend to really want to uh, get granular. Um, so I think you're going to see more and more of established filmmakers um, jumping into the medium to play with it. Haven't seen this kind of frothiness, excitement from the creative community about something in a while, um, which again is, is nothing but very exciting. Very cool. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. I grabbed my water bottle, I did everything I said. Excellent, thank you to Peter and Ian. So, uh, before we wrap up, we've got one important piece of business to do, which is to announce the winner, the most influential person using hashtag GamesBeat. Um, I just want to go through a couple of stats for you first. Using hashtag GamesBeat, we've had over 19.1 million potential impacts. So if you're in the room, or if you're watching online, you can give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you, everybody. And we've had a lot of people putting out a lot of tweets, but we used the power of science, uh, which is something that Fox News ought to uh, try sometime when they're building a chart. Um, so we used science to work out who the most influential person is. It's not necessarily the person with the most followers. It's the person who talks about this stuff. It's the person who resonates with their audience. It's the person who gets retweeted a lot, and people like their stuff. And it is with great pleasure that I can announce that the most influential person using hashtag GamesBeat is... Oh, drop. <laughs> Long drum roll. Put up the slide. It's Amber Osborne, Miss Destructo. Big round of applause for Amber Osborne. Congratulations to Amber. Uh, thank you to everybody who took part in tweeting using hashtag GamesBeat. It's been fantastic. Now it gives me an incredible pleasure to bring on stage to finish up the incredible, the legendary Dean Takahashi. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sticking around to the end here. Uh, I'm going to skip the closing marks uh, for a bit and uh, go straight to our slide on our upcoming events. 
Uh, we have two GameSpeed events coming up in 2016. Uh, GameSpeed Summit will be held at Cavallo Point in uh, Sausalito, May 3rd and 4th. GameSpeed uh, 2016 will be held, held here at the Grand Hyatt, September 19th and 20th. Uh, and don't forget, you will all get a uh, free uh, mobile user acquisition uh, report for being an attendee. Uh, you can pick up a card at the registration desk with a link to the report. And um, our surveys uh, around the ballroom, you're going to find event surveys. Uh, please help us improve the event by filling them out and uh, leaving them at your seat. We will uh, also be sending out surveys in our follow-up email. We would really appreciate it if you could uh, take the time to fill, fill it out and give us some feedback on the event. We definitely look at them. And uh, as I'm sure many of you saw out in the uh, exhibit area, Trial Pay has been hosting a game zone uh, out in the lobby for indie developers to showcase their up-and-coming games. Six developers were chosen for their innovation and creativity out of an extensive pool of applicants to demo their games uh, to our conference attendees and keep us entertained over the last two days. Uh, the winning developer to receive up to $20,000 in trial pays monetization and acquisition services, I am pleased to announce uh, is, uh, are you guys ready? Who's ready? Is everybody here from the event too? Cloudcade Shop Heroes. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, I'm not sure we're there, but go get your 20,000 bucks for the stuff. <laughs> all right, big thanks to all of our GamesBeat partners. Um, thank you to our partners. And thanks also to our event partners and our uh, media and strategic partners. And thank you all in the audience here for uh, sticking it out uh, to the, the end. Um, you're all honorary members of the Games Beat Night's Watch, uh, which is our, <laughs> our little community of people who love the games business. So day two saw some very memorable talks, like the emotional conversations with the Jessica Rovello of Arcadium, and our uh, diversity panel moderated by Gordon Bellamy. Uh, we saw information pack talks uh, by Nicole Lazaro uh, on designing for VR on GameSpeed Online, and Kate Edwards uh, and her windows into uh, working at Valve, maybe, or uh, into game developer satisfaction. Uh, Kate, of course, was the only one to get the memo to dress up like a, a Game of Thrones character besides myself. I'm uh, thinking next year we have to make the dressing up mandatory for every single speaker. And they have to dress up like a character in their games, right? So we started planning six months ago, and it's uh, very fulfilling to see these talks come to fruition uh, as executed by great speakers and moderators. Uh, we're glad to help reflect what is happening in the industry. Uh, but we also want to play a role uh, in setting the agenda and changing the industry. Uh, as Megan Geyser said, uh, this is where uh, we, we use all of our senses uh, to be creative. And uh, our organization, GamesBeat, uh, definitely tries to not have any blind spots here. Uh, there are many messages of change here. Uh, we hope you take them to heart and help them spread uh, to the right places in gaming. I think I should say Conference Morghulis, which is uh, in Game of Thrones talk would translate to all conferences must die. <laughs> uh, but in this case, uh, Games Beat 2015 will live on in some way in video form on our Twitch channel, uh, twitch.tv slash gamesbeat, uh, and in the stories that have been filed by our excellent Gamesbeat staff right there. Congratulations. And I'd like to once again thank our VentureBeat staff like Brianna Billingham, Katie Dono, Amy Hall, Megan Pul Pulver, Katie Jensen, Karen Williams, Stacey Cohen, Matt Kotler, the rest of our great sales team, our AV and production uh, partner Evergreen Creative, uh, and our volunteers. Thanks also to our founder, Matt Marshall, 
Lisa Serwin, Aaron Golden, Neil Shepard, John Cotier, Stuart Rogers, our outstanding MC, uh, and photographer Michael O'Donnell, and once again, our crew of GameSpeed writers. So, you are done, thank you. Uh, we're going to have a reception up on the 36th floor uh, to toast goodbye to GameSpeed. <laughs> thank you.